Wow. Good morning. Welcome to worship in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this third Sunday in Lent as we prepare our hearts and minds for what is to come in Holy Week and the celebration at the end. Um, I hope that we all um, pay attention to God's voice and uh, listen to his direction and take clues from him as to how we're to live because life is short. That's the title of the message today, Life is Short. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But as Christians, um, there are some definite, concrete instructions that Jesus gives us because our life is short. So um, that's what we're going to talk about today. We have a couple of people making announcements. So I'm going to ask Paul to make an announcement from the pandemic response team. Good morning. Happy spring. Unfortunately, it's still it's raining and cold outside, <laughs> but it will warm up. So um, the team met the pan pandemic response team met on March 13th, and as a team, we decided to um, lift all the uh, formal mitigation um, guidelines and leave it up to you as far as masking or social distancing however you feel uh, you need. And as you noticed, we took down the strings on the pews. So um, that is done. So we made it through it. So we're trying to get back to normalcy here. Um, so hope we can start shaking hands and doing some different things. But uh, thank you to the team. The committee did a great job. I mean, Mike, we got Jay and um, Tammy and Pastor Jim. So. Crystal, uh, the whole team was amazing, so they helped us through that. And as a team, we're going to meet when needed. So if we need to meet again, we will. So that's that's um, from our team. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Aaron has an announcement to make. A minute for ministry. <laughs> guess we don't have to use that podium anymore. Maybe that should go away. Okay, so the minute for ministry um, this month is for session. So there um, is this governing body uh, of our church that um, you as the congregation um, votes on. Uh, there are nine members to session. Um, so the way that the, the session works is there's uh, a nominating team, they nominate, have discussions with, pray about, um, and, and um, try and get people to agree to join this committee. Um, once that occurs, then the congregation, again, votes on the election of those people. Um, and session has a lot of different responsibilities. So um, first off, all session members also sit on another committee uh, within the church, whether that's deacons, mission, uh, fellowship, um, outreach, nominating, um, admin, property and grounds, all the different committees. So not only does a session member meet once a month um, for session, but they also have another meeting that they attend. Um, the reason is um, every month when we get together for our session meetings, which is the uh, third Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m., we bring all the information back from those meetings throughout the month and um, kind of report on things, if there's things that need voted on, um, financial responsibilities, use of the building, you know, different things like that, then session will vote on those items. Um, so there, there's, again, the main session that we sit on, um, but then we're kind of the representatives within all those different committees um, that the congregation can join. Um, as a session member, we serve three-year terms, and we can serve up to two terms um, consecutively, and then um, we have to take a, uh, a year off. Um, there is a uh, clerk of session, which um, I have served this current year and the previous year, um, who kind of is the, the bookkeeper of session, takes the minutes, um, reports all those to the secretary, but then also keeps up all of the church records as well. 
Um, so as you sit on session, there are a few other responsibilities um, that you must meet in addition to serving on a, commu on a committee. Um, we always kind of set the vision in the spiritual direction of the church. Um, years ago, under the, the guidance of Pastor Jim and Matt McKinley, we started this visioning process and kind of redirected what the vision was of the church. Um, and Session has been working on that pretty much ever since. Um, you know, during the pandemic, it was a little bit more difficult to do that. Um, but they, they directed where the church was heading. Um, so again, as a session member, that's kind of what we're doing. So at the beginning of every meeting, we open with a devotion and a prayer. Uh, and then Pastor Jim leads a elder training, um, you know, elder being session members. And it, it could be a wide variety of things that he comes up with. Again, for the longest time, uh, I want to say about a two-year process, it was the visioning process where we were setting the direction of the church. Um, you know, just this past week when we met, um, we had a lengthy discussion about evangelism and what that looks like, what that means, and we were charged to prayerfully consider our role in that process. Um, one thing that I did want to note as well um, with the session meetings, they are open to the public, so if you would like to sit in on one, we always love having guests join us, um, whether you just want to listen, hear what the church is doing, what vision is being set, the activities that are going on, or if you have a, uh, a new and a fresh idea, you can always bring those to the, to the session meetings, um, and you know, you'll have time to, uh, to present those um, to everybody. So um, that is our session. Um, those that sit on session, um, Pastor Jim is the moderator. Um, again, I'm the clerk of session. Um, we have Matt McKinley, um, Karen Owens, Ken Schulteis, uh, Paul Holinda, Tammy Maley, John McCraley, um, and I'm forgetting somebody. Uh, yes, sorry, Anna Mary. Um, and then next week, um, we are going to be voting on a new member, possibly, um, joining the session. That would be uh, Karen Peterman, who will be filling um, Carla Hart's term, if you all approve. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron. Um, there's been a tradition in this church of... Um, having very strong people as clerk of session. And it's been going on for a long time. And Matt McKinley was one of those serving as clerk, Aaron currently serving. And not only does Aaron as clerk of session do all the bookkeeping, record keeping, uh, and taking minutes at the meetings, um, he keeps me on task. So he keeps me following the agenda, and if I've left anything out of the agenda, he reminds me of that. So that's a valuable uh, associate to have. So I thank Aaron for his service. I think that's just about it for announcements. So let's prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Good morning. Our call to worship this morning is from the book of Psalm, chapter 63, verses 3 through 5. 
Your unfailing love is better than life itself. How I praise you. I will praise you as long as I live, lifting up my hands to you in prayer. You satisfy me more than the richest feast. I will praise you with songs of joy. Please stand if you're able as we sing our hymn number 84 in the Worship and Rejoice hymnal. Our holy God journeys with us throughout this Lenten season. As we journey together, God asks us to share with one another his peace. This will not only sharpen our focus on him, but will also help to prepare our hearts for his son and our savior, Jesus Christ. Please share this peace in whatever ways you feel comfortable with all of those around you. Our call to confession. Trusting ourselves to the grace of God, let us take a few moments to silently prepare our hearts by openly confessing to God. Take this time to honestly speak to God about your weaknesses and mistakes, believing that he will hear you and forgive you. The Apostle Paul reassures us with these words, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's own people, in order that you may proclaim the mighty acts of him who called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And that is from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 to 10.
Won't you please be seated, boys and girls, it's time for Kids Rock with Matt and Michelle McKinley. Our Old Testament reading today is from the book of Isaiah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, our prayers for illumination. God of all hope, we gather today so deeply aware of the world's grief and pain and our own. Comfort us, we pray, with the sure knowledge that our Lenten journey culminates in Easter joy. Speak to us from your word today for our own good. Amen. Testament reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 55, verses 6 through 9. Seek the Lord while you can find him. Call on him now while he is near. Let the wicked change their ways and banish their very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy on them. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Since the beginning of Lent, a little over two weeks ago, we have been talking about and reading and thinking about the upward call that God extends to every one of us. We began this season of Lent on Ash Wednesday by talking about how it is okay to cry about conditions of this world or any of the challenges surrounding any of us and all of us, anything we face every day. The important truth, as we were reminded, is to respond by recognizing God's eternal love and grace that supersedes any of those challenges. And it's given to us even in the middle of those challenges. Then we discussed two weeks ago about God's preparation and purpose for each of us, given to us, and shown even during any type of wilderness-type experience. Last week, Pastor Carey spoke about the comfort and peace of recognizing and realizing that our home is not here, but it's in heaven. 
Today, on this third Sunday of Lent, we want to focus on Jesus' teaching about our lives on this earth. You and I know that we should live according to Jesus' model. Yes, but how? During this season of Lent, we have mentioned that our focus is on giving thanks to the one who spared us from God's punishment for our sins. But this same Jesus Christ gave us the gift of today, the gift of life right now, and in the next moment, and in the next moment. Let's not waste this gift by returning to the ways of sin. Let's use this season of Lent to examine our own behaviors and live better because life is short. Jesus reminds the people around him in our passage today by telling parables, using some familiar items to them and to us, such as a fig tree. Listen in this passage from Luke, the truth that for Jesus, the real sin is not bearing fruit when we have been given the responsibility to do so in this short life of ours. We are planted where we are, and we are called to be responsible to be responsible disciples who do God's work wherever and in whatever ways we can. So please read with me from Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. This is the New Living Translation of God's Word. Hear God's Word. About this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee as they were offering sacrifices at the temple. Do you think those Galileans were worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee, Jesus asked? Is that why they suffered? Not at all. And you will perish too unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them? Were they the worst sinners in Jerusalem? No, and I tell you again that unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. A man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, Sir, give it one more chance. Leave it another year and I'll give it special attention and plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, fine. If not, then you can cut it down. May God bless our hearing of his word this day. Would you pray with me, please? Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Take a look. Is there a video clip? Take a look at this video clip, please.
That's just a strong visual reminder of what this Lenten season is all about for every one of us. The particular reading that I read from Luke begins with two incidents that are not mentioned anywhere else in the Bible. Pilate's slaughter of Galileans in the temple and the collapse of the tower at Siloam. Pilate had already proven himself capable of killing Jews who displeased him or opposed his policies. The crowd around Jesus when he told this, when he spoke, apparently wanted to see Jesus' response. Response to Romans slaughtering righteous Jews as they performed their Jewish religious duties in the temple. And the tower collapse killed several good and righteous people also, 18 to be exact. However, there was a belief at that time that any severe disasters or calamities only happened to people who deserve God's judgment, who had made terrible mistakes, and the truly righteous were spared any of those kind of calamities or disasters and suffering. Jesus clearly says, absolutely not. Absolutely not true. Jesus goes on to explain that our unpredictable life in a fallen world should prompt us to evaluate and review our own spiritual strength and our own spiritual condition. Even though Jesus' words about judgment and repentance are scary, on one hand, they do remind us that human life is a precious gift, very precious gift. And it can be taken away just like that. But his words also instruct us on how to live that precious life as short or as long as it might be. Do you think there are Christians today that really believe that a person's suffering is a result of his or her actions in their lives? There are people that believe that. Of course. Just to be clear, there is some truth to certain kinds of suffering happening because of our actions or inactions. There's a cause and effect to our health, for one thing. For example, an alcoholic who develops cirrhosis of the liver has no one to blame except himself or herself and his or her decision to drink alcohol in excess. There are some churches that are also guilty, though, of believing that there is always a true connection between bad things happening and that particular person's mistakes. That is a sinful belief. For example, there have been churches that have taught for many, many years that God's approval, God's love, God's blessing are all conditional based upon one's performance what you do. Therefore, some people who have experienced any kind of spiritual abuse or sinful teaching in any particular church have a distorted image of God. They begin to see God as a policeman, a policeman who will punish you for any mistakes or wrongdoing. And that is just not biblical. God does not use suffering as a punishment. The truth is, God does not want any of us to suffer. He wants us to turn away from our sin and turn to him so we can have abundant lives. But on the other hand, Jesus in Scripture didn't deny the connection between sin and some disasters because many disasters are the result of the curse of sin. The curse of human sin, as far-reaching as it is. And again, whenever we think deeply about what God is saying to us, in other words, his upward call, we will soon begin to realize that our life on earth may be shorter than we have planned. And it is all because of the far-reaching curse of sin. Very quickly, we can logically think, hmm, 
What is the solution to this unpredictable life that I never know when it's going to end? What's the answer? Jesus Christ, of course, is the easy answer. It's always the right answer. But it tells us we should say to ourselves, it's even more reason to clean up our hearts and to strengthen our spiritual living today, not tomorrow. Life is short. That is exactly what Jesus is teaching in this parable that follows these two incidents. Life is short. And we often use that phrase in joking to joke about it because it can depress us to think about this life ending tomorrow or in the next hour or even in the next minute. So we usually complete that phrase with things like, life is short, eat dessert first, right? You've heard these, some of these, or life, or life is short and so am I. Or there are more truthful and insightful phrases like a little more truthful, like life is short, so enjoy it to the fullest. And life is short, and then you die. Jesus tells us constantly and in different ways throughout Scripture, throughout the Gospels, that we do not know when our lives on earth will end, but that our eternal lives depend on how we live this one. I recently read this story about a man who borrowed a book from a friend. As he read through it, he was curious to find parts of the book underlined and the letters YBH written in the margin. YBH. When he returned the book to its owner, he asked what the YBH means. The owner replied that the underlined paragraphs were sections of the book that he basically agreed with, and they gave him hints on how he could improve himself and pointed out truths that he wished to incorporate into his life. However, the letters YBH stood for yes, but how? And that, friends, are the three letters that could be written on the margins of our souls in this life. I ought to know how to take better care of myself, but how? I, ought to, I know I ought to spend more time reading God's word or in prayer, but how? I know I ought to be more sensitive to others, more loving of my spouse, more understanding of the weaknesses of others, but how? These are all good qualities, and we know that. But how can we acquire them in this life, as short as it is? As Christ followers, we know the kind of life we ought to live, and most of us have the best of intentions to do so. But how do we do it? We are afraid because we know where the road paved with only good intentions leads. This morning, we've heard Jesus' parable about a fig tree, telling us to repent and bear good fruit, or else we'll be cut down because life is short. We know that the Christian life requires what the Christian life requires of us, and yet, if we are honest with ourselves completely, we also know how far short we fall from those goals. So the question that confronts us this morning is, yes, but how? And of course, Jesus gives us the specific answer to that question, yes, but how? That's the key to our dilemma, the answer to our question, yes, but how? How do we live this life of faith that we're called to live as followers of Christ? How can we do what we ought to do? The key to living the life worthy of our upward calling as children of God is to remember God has already set us free for those things, to live that way to answer that call. In Christ Jesus, I am free, and so are you. 
I am free to be who God has made me to be. It is up to me to get on with it. I only need to allow Christ to live in me and take control of my life. Now that's easier said than done, right? When you and I do that, only then will we bear the fruit that God wants us to produce that shows everybody else how we live. Bear the fruit. Jesus uses those words a lot, and he references fruit a lot. Figs, vines, grapes. There's a lot more others also. So here's what happens to us, though, in this, process, in this Christian journey and process. Sometimes we think that when we give up control of anything, but especially our lives, to Christ, we're no longer responsible for ourselves. Our American heritage has taught us that. We're no longer responsible, but just the opposite is really true. When we turn our lives over to God, allow Christ to direct us, then we become truly responsible for ourselves. Not just our actions, for ourselves. How we live, how we speak, how we respond, how we serve. Jesus' parable of the fig tree calls us to take responsibility for ourselves. For God gives us the key. Repent, Jesus says, first. Confess your sins and allow the power of God to live in you. Allow God to enable you to live as you should live. Let Jesus take possession of you and then truly live in him. The fruit will come out of you. It has to, in many ways. I can still remember one of my early installation services in Pittsburgh Presbytery at a church, Reverend Dan Mary, whom I had asked to preach the message that day, talking about, he read scripture in Timothy, 1 Timothy, about producing fruit as a Christian and as a minister of word and sacrament. And he joked about the fact that all of us in the room knew that some of the best fruit ever produced by Reverend Jim Kirk are his beautiful daughters who are sitting right there. Now, not only did that embarrass me, but I knew that was true. And I have never forgotten those words in Dan's sermon because it's true and because it's scriptural. It's right out of God's word. As Christian parents, we know that some of the most important fruit we can ever produce or will ever produce are our children, our grandchildren, and a lot of other people around us. If you and I can help in even the smallest way to point someone else to Jesus Christ or encourage them to strengthen their relationship or even cause them to take the first step in building their faith, we have produced fruit for God's kingdom. And it's invaluable. And you don't have to have children to do that. Even though we may possibly misunderstand what Jesus is really telling us sometimes, because it's confusing sometimes, we can be sure of his love and his eternal promise of life. And we can be confident that Jesus, in his short life on earth, because it was short, did challenge the idea and the thinking that people who survive disasters are morally superior to any or all of the victims. He challenged that regularly. Disasters are not God's way of singling out evil people for death. Disasters are God's way of warning all of us sinners how short this life is. Because all disasters occur without warning, we must always be ready to meet God. Always. Are you ready? This parable about a fig tree being cut down because it's not producing fruit is really about us 
not producing fruit. The message or lesson is the same in this second half of our reading as it was in the first. Life is short. Any good we could do in this world needs to begin right now because life is short. That's the main truth that Jesus is trying to uncover for his audience, including us. Here's a question that all of us must confront at some time or another. You can ignore this for many, many years, even your entire life, but you're going to confront it eventually. And here's the question. Do you measure your life? Have you measured your life by a number of years or by the positive impact that you've made on anyone or anything, especially God's kingdom? How do you measure it? Has your life made a difference for God? Fruitfulness is the measure of how much our lives reflect God's character and God's love. That's the definition. That's the biblical definition. There's one last insight, though, that we can take from this parable of the fig tree. No matter how short a life might be, a fruitful life will always leave a powerful and a positive legacy. Now, legacy is not something that you and I talk about a lot until near the end of our lives, right? But we should. There are probably few of us who think of our lives in terms of leaving a legacy. We try to live live good and faithful lives. We work on helping others and being good people at work or in our volunteering. Those are all good things. But leaving a powerful and positive legacy requires intentional commitment repeatedly in our daily living. In short, it requires a very strong faith in the God who can equip us to leave that legacy whenever or wherever our life here ends. I would like to close today by telling you about this example of a young man who wanted to be a missionary. This young man's name was Ben, and he was struggling with this important decision. He had been struggling with the desire to be a missionary for a long time, actually. He was concerned about how hard the missionary life is. What if he failed? Who would instruct him on how to be? A missionary. He asked his dad, what if God calls me to do something I can't do? But Ben's dad was quiet for a moment, then he spotted his son's baseball glove on the floor and he picked it up and he said, what's this? Ben laughed, don't be silly dad, it's my glove. Dad propped the glove up against the opposing wall and he tossed a baseball into it. And, of course, the ball rolled out of the glove and across the floor. Well, Ben's dad picked up the glove and remarked, your glove is a total failure. Didn't make the catch. Ben smiled. It can't catch by itself. He said, the glove doesn't work too well unless my hand is in it. Dad nodded. You're just like this glove. God has a purpose for your life, Ben. You put your hand inside the glove to give it guidance and strength. You give it the power to catch the ball. In the same way, God will place his hand within you and give you the power to do whatever he asks you to do. It's his mighty hand that does the work when you are willing to be used. Friends, our fruitful lives begin when we place it in God's hands, when we allow God's hand to work within us. He does the work because he knows how short your life is. He knows exactly how short your life is and wants you to bear fruit for his kingdom immediately. Amen.
in our prayer time, we want to first stand, if you're able, and state what we believe. This comes from a document called Our World Belongs to God. Remembering the promise to reconcile the world to himself, God joined our humanity in Jesus Christ, the eternal word made flesh. He is the long-awaited Messiah, one with us and one with God, fully human and fully divine, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Being both divine and human, Jesus is the only mediator. He alone paid the debt of our sin. There is no other Savior. We are chosen in Christ to become like him in every way. God's electing love sustains our hope. God's grace is free to save sinners who offer nothing but their need for mercy. Amen. Please be seated. In our continuing time of prayer, we want to offer all of those things on our hearts and minds, joys, concerns, requests, praise, thanksgiving, that we want to give up to God trusting that he will respond in his way and in his time. Gloria. Today? I'm going to in a moment. <laughs> you can, you can, you want to talk about the luncheon? The other half of that important announcement is the memorial service is at 11.30, and we will then have the luncheon downstairs afterwards. Um, the family's expecting, some of them are expecting 100 people, some of them are expecting 50. So nobody seems to know. Roma touched a lot of people, and um, so we just don't know, but everyone's welcome. Anyone else? So prayers for the Park family during this time. I was informed yesterday that Marie Molnar has passed away yesterday morning. Um, there will be a service here on April 2nd. I don't have a time yet, um, but that's a Saturday also. Um, so there'll be a service here for Marie on April 2nd. So stay tuned for more details um, when I get them. Yeah, um, so prayers for the Park family, prayers for the Molnar family as well. Anna, Anna Mary. And so does Harry. Dawn. Um, I just want to thank everybody who signed up to bring something tonight for our family game night. So I'm so thankful for all of your support and we're super excited. And thank you to my precious husband who put so much time into making the game really fun. And I'm just very thankful for that. 
If you haven't played a game with Mike as the host, you're in for a treat. <laughs> he, he missed his calling, I think. We'll keep it PG-13. <laughs> <laughs> Ruth. Thank you for that. Those of us going to the leadership conference over in Cranberry, it's at two. So we'll be back by five or 5.30. <laughs> Anyone else? Let's take all of our prayers to God. Lord God of the blessed, we praise you for mercy shown, grace given, living water, and your spirit's power. We ask you for daily strength, hope for tomorrow, your word to guide strong feet of ours to follow. The psalmist reminds us, show me your ways, O Lord, teach me your paths, guide me in your truth, and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Lord God of the oppressed, we bring to you the broken ones in prayer, forgotten ones, exploited and abused ones. Bring freedom and release, bring love and compassion to damaged hearts and souls. Bring your healing as the great physician to physical ailments and lack of strength. And most of all, bring your strong faithfulness and righteousness to those who are in doubt or who are worrying and in anxiety. God of compassion, hear all of our prayers today and every day as we speak to you in our hearts and minds or aloud with our voices. Lord God of the distressed, we bring to you the grieving ones, hurting ones, suffering and wounded ones. Bring wholeness and healing, comfort and relief, eternal peace and strength to broken bodies and minds. Lord God, you've heard our prayers this day for many people in many circumstances. We ask your blessing, your blessings of peace and strength and faith for the Park family and the Molnar family. Walk with them as they grieve. Strengthen them as they continue their walk of faith and help us to celebrate um, their memories of loved ones and our church family members. Lord God, we lift up Anna Mae and Harry to you and ask that you lend your healing hand upon both of them. Take them and direct them and surround them with your loving care through specialists, doctors, surgeons, and loved ones. Lord God, we ask your blessing upon our church family this night as we gather in fellowship. May your presence be known and shown and may your love surround all of us. We thank you for the lives of those who have gone before us. We thank you for the blessing of their ministry. And we thank you most of all for the knowledge of eternal life in you, for them. So Lord God, we lift up our prayers on this day in the strong name of Jesus, your Son, who taught us when we pray to say these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. 
Almighty God draws us all into this renewing relationship of love with him. And our response in gratitude should be our own offering of our personal time, talents, and treasures. Resources that have been freely given to us by God and that we freely give away for God's work in this world. So to continue the ministry of Christ in the world as his hands and feet includes the sacrificial giving of gifts through the body of Christ, this body of Christ. Please give as your heart tells you to give and according to your faith commitments. And thank you um, for your generosity and your faithful giving toward God's work. So let me offer a dedication prayer for all of our gifts. Let us pray. Almighty God and Father in heaven, you overwhelm us with your great mercy. At the time of our greatest needs, you surprise us with your wondrous love and forgiveness. Please continue to bless our response in giving these gifts. Use our gifts, multiply our gifts, and apply our gifts for your great plans for all of humankind here and across the world. Transform each of us into the people you want us to be through our offering of ourselves. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. Now please join me in standing, if you're able, and singing our closing hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. flowers. The order forms are in the back or the front. So please fill one out if you're interested in Easter flowers. The deadline is next Sunday, March 27th. Now the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and give you his grace. May the Lord turn his countenance toward you and give you his peace. So go with the love of God, the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, the fellowship, guidance, and strength of the Holy Spirit today and every day. Amen.